I will share my presentation for now, although I'm going to get in and out of this. You should be able to see the presentation now. Um, and if you can see the presentation, please write in the chat, find the click the button that says chat, write one in the chat. So I know that you can see the presentation. Super, I see a lot of ones already. So I'm going to start by saying that um, I'm a human rights activist. Um, I am by no means an expert in data analyzing, <laughs> but um, I work with data in um, uh, various occasions. Um, uh, I work, first of all, for AIDS Action Europe um, from the role of the strategic communications uh, specialist. I'm, uh, I have been a member of the steering committee of uh, AIDS Action Europe in the past, and I have been representing AIDS Action Europe in the steering committee of COBA test that has been organizing these um, um, uh, webinars. And uh, I will be using some of the um, examples, real life examples from the local organization that I volunteer for, and I am a member of the board of, which is the AIDS Solidarity Movement in Cyprus with the CBVCT Center that is a member of COBA test network, the Cyprus checkpoint. So um, just to say a few uh, things, um, uh, starting up, uh, there's no conflict of interest in terms of um, this presentation, but I will start with saying that I'm going to um, take you through a journey, let's say, um, to touch different aspects of um, of visualizing data. So um, in order to understand a bit, the, let's start with the first part, which is who is your audience? I would like to know who is my audience. So um, let's do a scale and use the chat again, where you can uh, write from a scale one to five. Uh, one means um, that you are a, 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 you have no relationship with data, or very little relationship with data. And five means you are kind of an expert in terms of data analysis and working with data. So if you can write and evaluate your knowledge, your relationship with data, I'm talking basically about analysis. So I have an idea of uh, what is my audience. So I see already some numbers. Very nice, very nice. So while you're writing this and I get this um, idea of data, I'm going to give you my perspective of the data. I'm not a data analyst, as I said, but I have been doing some um, basic analysis in different researches that we've ra run in Cyprus through the local organization and through the university that I work with. And I basically, um, apart from analyzing or participating in the analysis of data, that would be more correct. Um, I can also say that um, um, I'm, I'm quite interested in how we present not only the data themselves or itself, but the results that we have and um, um, uh, uh, the final outcomes and the uh, uh, overall conclusions that come from the data. So as a short introduction, I will play um, a short movie that goes back, um, I think, like a decade or more. And this will be our first thing to... So discuss. here we go. First, an axis for health, life expectancy, from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person, 400, 4,000, and $40,000. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? 
all countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. So, um, this is an introduction and I want to start from this. Um, I will provide you with um, presentation so you get the whole video. Uh, it's not the whole video, I just got a piece of it. Um, I will start with some uh, uh, information on data and how we view data and take you through a journey um, which I hope that will help the those of you who don't have much experience with data, but also the people that have experience with data to look at uh, visualization in a different way. So what do we see from this video? That um, this guy has um, presented um, uh, one uh, axis X for displaying the years and then another one Y for displaying the income uh, per person. Um, so we have two parameters basically the, uh, that are being displayed. But not only that, he used uh, the sizes of the bubbles to give a third parameter, which is the size of population. He also used the uh, time perspective, um, which is basically moving this static chart into different years and changing the position so we, you could have some kind of a uh, perspective into time. And at the end, he uh, talked about the trend. So he's visualizing in a video a number of different parameters, which is quite complex to present so many parameters. 
Um, of course, he has the technology and it was uh, like, I think, like around 15 years, uh, the, this video. I thought it was quite interesting to start with the very basics. So let's talk about basic parameters when you represent data. Obviously, you have the X and Y axis, and then you have your data, which is now represented as um, bars, basically. So in reality, you have each a piece of data that you want to compare on the uh, axis Y. And of course, each one of these bars are um, have a different height. So they are, um, uh, they represent a different value. One thing that uh, it's quite interesting and I learned it from music and I put it into uh, data is that um, you see that there is, the, uh, it's not very nice to have the values on the, left on the x axis when they are not really um uh, they don't have the same heights um so it's like you have two parameters that you are presenting that are not balanced let's say in um in a uh, way that it can easily be read whereas if you had for example the axis in um uh values let's say 50, 100, 150, 200, I'm just giving an example now, but in um, in a way that it can be read, then you can actually keep one of the parameters steady, which is the X um, uh, axis. And the second parameter, you can have it uh, with a variable and you can read it along the lines. So one thing that I want you to keep in general is, and we will find it later on with the colors and with information and with words as well, that try to keep a balance when you have one a parameter that is changing a lot, um, then try to have the other parameters organized in a way so that that parameter that is variable, it's easier to the eyes and to the mind to read. So if you have variables, try not to have a thousand variables. Try to have um, elements that give a static um, uh, idea of the background where, uh, where the variables can actually uh, be represented. Now, going back to this, obviously the black bars are is a one set of data that we can compare, but we can start adding parameters and then have other um, bars, the gray bars, for example, where you can uh, um, compare the black to the gray bars, for example. So the data set that, the first data set that we're comparing is uh, the black bars, and the second one is the gray bars. And obviously, um, it's not always enough to um, compare the two just by seeing static images. We don't have the technology that this guy in the video I showed you has to actually do this kind of production where you are presenting a thousand parameters, changing live at the same time, but we can still start visualizing different trends by seeing what is not very clear to the eye or to the trained eye, let's say. So let's say, do you see the trend of the gray bars going up, increasing? So an, another parameter could be the trend of increasing throughout the y-axis. This would make sense if the y-axis is um, it's, uh, related to time. So it's a time perspective. If it was not related to time, then um, I can't think how the relationship of increasing could be... Um, uh, related, but you could connect these um, uh, bars by taking the, um, uh, the, the way that they increase or decrease. And obviously the red line that I've presented here is a red line on the gray bars, but obviously there is one for the um, black bars as well. So, so you realize that, uh, you know, there is a lot of information here that uh, it might become crowded. So let's say you have the data one sets with the black bars. You have the data two sets with the gray bars. You have the red lines, the red line, the green line, and you have the different vertical and um, horizontal lines that come from the axis. But if I just keep just the lines 
and I make the bars disappear, then although they show somehow they are based on the same data, they show different perspectives of the data that we have. And what is shown, you know, when I was here, maybe it was not so clear, um, especially if you have all this data and numbers and uh, descriptions of, Iraq, of each access and of each uh, um, uh, black bar and of each uh, gray bar, it's not very easy to see clearly what you want to uh, focus on. So um, if I just keep that, for example, then we start seeing some more information that maybe we didn't see with the bars, which is, for example, the point where the two um, uh, trends meet, where one trend met the second one, or, for example, the point where the green line started having a decrease. And this gives a perspective and allows us to see more clearly what the, the same data say, because it's actually the same data, the same data that I created the bars are the same data that uh, have given me the points to connect and create the lines. So what I'm trying to tell you with all that is that they are, they are the same data, but what you do with the data is what you want to put out. So have in mind that, you know, um, um, I would say, you know, um, uh, let's, it's like an orchestra with a lot of instruments that are playing different notes and different uh, 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 sounds. And uh, um, you hear a whole thing, but if, if you really want to have the violin being heard, then you have to put it up front and clear out the rest of them by putting them to uh, play in a lower um, intensity, for example, or uh, less volume. So you can have one of these parameters, the violin, so sounding uh, more clearly. So what I'm trying to give you with this, let's say, introduction is don't try to give all the information in one chart. Focus on one of the thing, uh, or one of the parameters that you want to highlight, and choose which or, or which visualization is going to be helping you to put this out uh, in a more clear, uh, clear, clear way. And if you want to show show a second or a third parameter, for example, from the same data, then you can create a different graph or a different visual. So. Um, it's quite interesting to, um, uh, I'm taking you through this journey to, with, with a very generic uh, image, just to see what we can do with this data. For example, we have the data of the black bars, we have the data of the gray bars, we have the lines, but we can also represent in the graph the black bars, and then the gray bars we can represent it with a line instead of um, having uh, bars for the gray bars as well. So uh, in a way, we are still presenting the data of the gray bars, but represented in a line, while the data of the bar of the black bars are rep uh, is represented from the bars. So how do I decide what to do, what to choose, which um, uh, which visualization is more suitable uh, according to what I want to do. Well, the key is what I want to do. So the idea is the goal. You need to know beforehand, what do you want to show? What is that element, that parameter that you want to highlight to put under the spotlight? And which are the other ones that it's not their time yet to shine. So you have to keep them uh, slightly um, outside the spotlight. So in order to do that, you have to have a clear idea of the goal, and you also need to create the path to do it. What is the path? Uh, the, in the video that I showed you, it was not just a video where it di displayed um, information and you had to figure out um, what the round icons were that were the population, for example, of the countries, or what was the vertical axis that was the um, years, or what was the horizontal axis that was the, the income. You also had that guy who was uh, basically presenting um, uh, and explaining and giving uh, um, uh, something more than just an explanation. 
um, he was guiding you through what he wanted you to focus on. So this is the path that you have to create wherever you are going to be presenting data. Uh, either this is uh, for uh, um, community organizations that want to showcase their work or advocacy or any other purpose. So you need to have a plan of where you start and where you're going. And in order to do that, oh, obviously there are some skills needed uh, that you, we can all and we are all developing through the work that we are doing. Obviously, critical thinking, problem solving mind, communication skills to be able to present something, and basically mathematical abilities. Now, I'm not sure if, judging from the first question of how many of you are working with the data, I'm not sure um, if the people who work less with data feel confident with their basic mathematical abilities. I'm not an expert with uh, mathematics, but what I can tell you is like average um, uh, aspects that you need to know, you can always ask Google and follow um, the instructions or watch videos and check how to do something that you don't know. So I'm saying that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You can look into something that you don't know, very useful um, uh, elements are, for example, in terms of mathematical, basic mathematical abilities is to create an average number or a percentage. Still, um, this is a screenshot from Google and you can even find, you can see that the percentage calculator is the second uh, thing that comes up on Google. So it can actually uh, produce that for you. So today we are not, we don't need to be mathematical experts to do basic uh, presentations. And also we have the series that we've tried um, through Cobatest to um, create this series of webinars. Uh, uh, if you haven't watched them and you need to get some perspective of the basic data management and analysis uh, and the second uh, uh, seminar, please go ahead and, um, and do so. I've included the link as well. Um, there, I see that there is... Um, something in the chat, I'm not sure if it's regarding. Oh, super, thank you, Shabi. So um, uh, the link is there as well. Um, so going back to this and uh, following up the, the journey that I'm taking you, I just wanted to move forward and say that, you know, you can represent the bars beside each other, but what if we put them on top of each other? Well, how would that change? Well, we have some problems here because you will realize that it doesn't make much sense because there are a lot of variables. For example, you have this line that divides the gray and the black uh, bars that is not the same for all the bars that we see when we put them one on top of the other. So one way could be to straighten the uh, X line and uh, have a common parameter, for example, instead of having up and down. Um, uh, uh, so so you, we can be able to compare the same things. But what if also, apart from the middle line, what if we go up and strengthen the top and adjust the bars in a way that all the bars together with the black and gray areas have the same height? Um, so you'll see that there is, again, this um, uh, perspective that I gave you that in order to keep um, uh, the variables show, uh, you see the X are the variables that are different and they are not uh, uh, similar. You need to have also other variables that you keep them um, so you can compare the same uh, you can compare uh, different parameters in, uh, in the same uh, context. So you do realize that when you have the same height of the bar, then you see the whole thing, and then you basically compare the whole bars and compare how much of black there is and how much of gray there is. So you do, um, uh, this is the concept of, you know, comparing the percentage of a whole. And of course, we have you. We, you you can visualize uh, a bar with the percentages and compare it to the whole, which is the whole height. Or you can use a, a, a circle for the same thing, which is basically uh, the thirty six degrees of the circle is the whole, just like in a bar, the whole height is the hundred percent. 
And then it can start becoming um, more complex, having more parameters, having three parameters, for example, in this percentage, or even more. And now we start seeing the importance of being able to see the different parameters and uh, being able to uh, see the different colors of uh, uh, the parameters. So when we are talking about percentages, basically, um, a great way to, to present these are the pie charts. You can see them as a whole chart, or you can see them as a a donut, you know, a chart with a hole in the middle. It's basically the same uh, idea. And then you are comparing each piece of the pizza, let's say, to the hole. So that's the uh, aspect of the percentage. Now, if we talk a bit about trends, um, just to put the same uh, understanding uh, for everybody, uh, the trend that I said before has to do with the time perspective. So you see different bars that have a specific time perspective. We are watching at April, May, June, July, for example, on the um, Y um, axis. And then on the top axis, you can see the 0, 25, 50, 75, 100. Again, what I tried to explain before that we're trying to keep the numbers um, that would make sense uh, from the first to the next. So you can see the different variables of the blue bars. Um, and this is the line that I was showing you before. So you have the uh, X axis, which is the numerical one. You have the Y axis, which is the perspective of time. In this case, is a year, for example. If you're presenting data um, for every year, you could use this. And if you want to compare, you could connect the... Um, um, each um, height of the, um, the bar to show this perspective in time. But this perspective in time, you know, the, um, the actual line doesn't need to be connected. It could be um, a different uh, a paramet uh, pa uh, parameter. So you still would have the two axes, the X and Y, and then you would add the purple lines, um, the, the purple line that is a different parameter, and compared to the uh, blue bars, that is another parameter. So it doesn't need to be connected. You can connect them or you don't need to. So um, going into um, having a bit uh, of the same idea, but with different ways of visualizing the data, you can have the two lines like I showed before, where you still have the parameters of the Y and X um, axis and the parameters are the green line and the blue line and then you can still have the uh, the green area the green area or the blue area obviously this way of visualizing this data um, makes sense if you want to give a time perspective for example I'm showing here on the uh, legend uh, of, of the purple line that these for example could be the uh, reactive tests that the CBVCT center is doing and compare it to the total tests that have been done in a year. So you can draw some conclusions that the um, testing that has been taking place in a center, for example, is increasing in general numbers in total, but the positive tests, the reactive tests that the, uh, are found, for example, per year is decreasing. Um, the, this is just uh, ideas to show you how we can use this kind of data. And then, um, let's go into a bit more complicated um, visualization. So um, you'd see that this is uh, one element against the two axes, which is the, um, the blue bars, basically. Um, yeah, so one perspective that we compare through different months. And then we can add a second element, which means that we have two bars now. So it's important to separate them in colors, but it's also important to keep the same color for the same parameter. So if we are comparing two different parameters, let's say the testing that is being done on HIV and the testing that is being done on syphilis, then you have to always have HIV with the same color, let's say blue, and the syphilis test always with the green color. So you can basically compare the two. It can go on and on and it can become more complex so you can have three parameters, obviously, or four parameters. And that's 
more or less where I would stop <laughs> even the four parameters, I would say, try to find a different way to present the four parameters unless it's completely uh, necessary. Um, there are more complex charts, obviously, uh, where you can have four parameters within the um, different uh, uh, um, months. So here you have four parameters for different bars that they can change in time, going from April to May to June and to July. And let me just say that this is something that I created with a similar program like um, Excel, Microsoft Excel. This was created with uh, Apple Numbers. There is also the spreadsheets of the Google, um, the Google Sheets. So these are all tools that we can use to show more complicated data if we want to show more than two or three parameters. And obviously you can move, um, uh, rotate the results and move uh, the axis the other way around where you have the months uh, or the description, let's say, of what each bar is on the left. And then you have the numerical axis on the bottom. And the same thing goes uh, for the more parameters that play a different role. So just to wrap up, um, we basically have, uh, I would call the pie chart for uh, uh, percentages. So it's a more simple way of displaying um, the, um, the comparison with the whole. And that's why we, uh, it's, a, it's very useful to show it uh, as a percentage. It doesn't need to be a percentage, but usually we use this for percentages because it's quite easy to do so. Um, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a, a, a circle. And then when you move to the, um, uh, to the bar charts and to the graphs of the middle that you say when you want to give some perspective. And then for more complex parameters that you have more than three or four parameters or even more, you have to find more um, ways to display this. My suggestion in general, especially if out of one to five um, expertise in data analysis or data presentation, let's say, because you could be a five in a data analysis, but the presentation, uh, you could be a two, for example, like I could be a four or a five in presenting, but a one or two in data analysis. So I think it's a good idea to keep things simple. I will come up, I will come back with this. Uh, just keep this in mind. It's a simple way of remembering. It's the visualization 101, I would say. Keep the proportions in a pie chart. Keep the time perspective and to show trends in lines and bars. And for more complex stuff, try to find other tools that are more demanding. Now, obviously, some live, real life examples. This is from ECDC. I think it's taken from the stigma survey that was done. You see the uh, percentages this time, not in a pie chart, but in bars. You can definitely um, see the comparison between the blue that is feeling compressed, all the blue uh, bars are the feeling depressed, and the green that is not feeling depressed. So it's a, a variable of a one and zero, yes and no. Um, then you, um, you have each bar with a description on the uh, Y axis. For example, the first two bars, it says rejected by friends, and you see that the people who are feeling depressed is 31%, and the people who are not feeling depressed is 18%. So the vertical uh, X axis is the percentage. So it's a way to present, uh, present uh, percentages, not in a pie chart. Um, the same thing goes with uh, putting the, um, uh, the pieces of the bar one top of the other, but you still need to have the same height so the same, the full height when it's exactly the same for all the, the bars, it's the 100%. And then the variables uh, you have in each bar should be, uh, you should be using the same color for each one. So you can pretty much recognize the trend. You see, uh, for example, how big or small the areas of each color is or are, for example, the red one, it starts from friends and when it goes to the family, it's a lot bigger. So you have a visual representation that it's that percentage is bigger uh, in terms of the 
family members uh, and the red uh, percentage compared to the friends, which is the none percentage. So moving on, you see the other representation. I'm not going to go through this, it's just to give you some real life example. And this is one of the examples that I suggested that you don't use, but ECDC does. So um, I think it's a good idea to have in mind that it is a more complex chart. You need some more time to figure out what the colors mean, what each group of bars mean, what each parameter for the Y and the X axis mean. So some real life examples of more um, uh, work that we that I have been using at the Cypress Checkpoint to come a bit closer to the audience that we are, or community organizations doing testing, for example. So these are data from 2023. I've used a pie chart to show that 59% who got tested uh, in 2023 and where Cypriot nationals are uh, one part of the pie, and then you've got a 40.3% 40 uh, uh, 40 that are not Cypriots. And then you have the yellow part, which is 0.7, who did not tell us uh, if they are Cypriot citizens or not. This is um, another example where you see the comparison through the years of how many tests were done uh, serving Cypriot nationals and how many tests were done serving, serving non-Cypriot nationals. This, there is a difference between this chart and the next one that I will show you. This chart is absolute numbers, which means it's the exact numbers that we did. We are a small country, so you'll see that the total, for example, for 2015 was 239 tests, and then we had 14 tests serving uh, 14 non-Cypriots doing tests uh, at the Cyprus checkpoint and 225 uh, Cypriots doing uh, tests in 2015 to have the total of 239. Now, if I, instead of presenting the absolute numbers, if I turned all the numbers into percentages, then you're going to come up with this. They are the same data, exactly the same data, but now we see them with percentages. I haven't changed that much um, the bars in the background because I'm more interested in the lines. Look at how the perspective with absolute numbers don't really show the, the trend. You can see that the, the testing overall in 2017 has increased and then down, uh, it has gone down for 2020 and 2021, the COVID years. But then if you see the percentages, you'll see that there is a trend where um, the non-Cypriots are increasing in terms of the percentage and the, the Cypriots are decreasing uh, compared to the Cypriots. So you can draw some conclusions that this center has been reaching more migrants through the years or the other way around. More migrants are trusting this center to come and get tested in the center. And by having the perspective of the percentage, of course, when one variable increases in the 100%, the other one will decrease anyway. The actual numbers doesn't necessarily decrease because you'll see that in 2023, the total numbers were 722 tests. So the, the numbers are increasing, but the percentage gives you the trend and the perspective. So you need to try out, is it better to, for some data, to present absolute numbers or is it better to present percentages? What does, what do you want to say? And what um, uh, conclusion or what um, comments you want to make using this chart? So you have to choose the appropriate and the most suitable chart for your goal. Now, moving a bit on, I wanted to show that the Cyprus checkpoint is a multinational uh, checkpoint, basically. So I didn't do a, a mathematical presentation. I just got a world map and I presented the points where people told us they come from. And this is a nice non-mathematical, let's say, 
but still a visual way of data had to present that, you know, we have beneficiaries from all over the world. And by creating these dots that appear one after the next, then you have this effect of basically making a point while this slide is playing that, you know, we have people from all around the world, which says a lot about the quality of work that you are doing in your checkpoints, in your CBVCT centers, if you attract people from all around the world. Moving on to ethnic groups, again, pie charts, you'll see that they are, these are declared basically um, uh, ethnic groups that we have in the uh, client form that we use and we ask people to tell us um, how they self-identify. And you'll see that there is a no answer for 53 people, which is the 7.3%. But still, you can uh, draw a conclusion that the vast majority is white, and then the rest uh, breakdowns uh, is uh, showing uh, what people self-identified with. The same thing goes for a permanent stay in Cyprus. Those are the different regions in Cyprus. I'm moving on because this is the, um, the now, and I'm coming to this one, which is something, again, there are two slides. This is the first one of a question that we have, have you ever got tested for HIV before? And you'll see that for the year 2023, 63% said, yes, we have been tested before. And then we have a, about one third, 36%, who said, no, this is my first time that I'm going to get tested or that I am being tested for HIV. So one every three people who came in 2023, it was their first time to get tested. But let's see what happens with the two every three people. So the 63%. In order to break this green pie uh, piece, that uh, people said, yes, I have been tested for HIV before. I've isolated this green part and broken it into different shades of green and made the rest of it gray. So you can see the people who said, yes, they have been tested before. 25 almost percent said they have been tested in the last six months. 13% said they have been tested in the last year and about 25% said they have not been te tested in the last month. They have been tested more than, uh, sorry, uh, in the last year. They have been tested more than a year ago. So it's a way to break down this green percentage that looks big. If it makes sense for you and you want to analyze it further, yes, keep the same data, keep the same cycle at the same location in your slide. So when you change the slide, you will have this effect that you are breaking down the green. And if the initial color is green, for example, keep the initial color and play with the shades. Um, we will talk a bit about it with the color uh, aspect as well. Now, you also see here the absolute numbers for ever got tested before. These are the absolute numbers. The, uh, the line is the total numbers and then the no I have not been tested is red and the yes uh, I have been tested before is green and then I, I move to the percentages where people said no is the line and people said yes are the bars so I'm wondering which one you think is more useful and I would like to ask you to write if you feel that the first slide this one the absolute numbers are more useful, for example, for this kind of uh, um, um, data. Uh, if you feel this is more useful, please write one. And if you feel that this is more useful, please write two in the chat um, for the specific data, for the specific um, uh, question. So one is the absolute number showing who got uh, tested for the first time, basically, which is the red ones, who said, no, I have not been tested before. And then the two, which is the percentages that show the yes number go growing up and the uh, no, the people who got tested for the first time going down. So what is interesting for me, I see some ones and some twos, I have to tell you that the, it, there is no right answer. It depends what you want to say. If you want to say that, for example, uh, during COVID, what happened during 2020, 2021, and 2022, basically the people who already knew us and already were 
testing with us kept on coming and doing testing, then this is the chart to show this because it's very visible that the people who did not know us and had a difficulty accessing the services did not show up. It was COVID, we had lockdowns. Obviously, the people who did not get tested were less. And obviously, during the COVID, we were testing people who already knew us and they were coming and they were returning clients. And then you also have um, the, uh, the previous one, the absolute numbers, where it would make sense to show um, the trends of who got tested and who got, did not get tested compared to the total. And that's why I included the third um, uh, variable. And you are right, Pavel, because it's the binary category. Uh, so the, the first one has three elements, three variables that we can compare. It's the yes and no together with the total. And uh, the uh, percentage is the yes or no that would make sense if you want to make uh, um, uh, the appropriate, um, um, let's say, uh, conclusions. Now, again, I will skip on the prep and pep so we have some time to chat as well. Um, so this is another example of how we use the, uh, this uh, data to give some more information. Uh, we have a question that says number of sexual partners in the last six months, and you'll see that the people who answered uh, told us how many sexual partners they had in the last six months. What was interesting was to combine the people with more sexual partners, the six to 12 partners or more than 12 partners that were not a lot. It was like a percentage it, from the chart. It looks like it's not a lot of people who had more than six uh, partners is something like 16% um, uh, about, where if you add the 8.9 and the 7.1 is a 16%. Now, if you get these two percentages, the 16% of people who had sexual partners more than six uh, partners in the last six months, and you combine it and see from the data analysis out of these people who answered, isolate these people who answered more than six partners and see if they were using condoms, for example, you'll see that out of 115 people who said that they had six to 12 or more than 12 sex partners in the last six months, 95 out of 115, so the 82%, said they had condomless sex in the last year. So this is a way to analyze and see other perspectives as well if this serves what you want to say. Obviously, this is it depends where you're going to use it because um, these, pers uh, these people might uh, uh, be having a, a condomless sex with their steady partner and uh, using condoms with other partners. So it doesn't necessarily say things. Um, you, you have to be careful when you're drawing conclusions but still there are information. So uh, wrapping up, keep it simple, keep the clarity, keep the simplicity, keep the data easy to read and understand. It's very important not to mix a lot of variables together and um, unless, unless this is a, a must, I would say if you don't have an intention to do it specifically for a specific reason, try to keep it simple. Keep it exciting, try to, um, Put the variables and the widgets that you need in your presentation, and you don't necessarily need to have um, only one um, chart or only pie charts or only bar charts or only lines. Combine things um, so it can be uh, more exciting when you're presenting data and uh, maintain a logical layout, which means prioritize the readability, choose the things that need to show up and to be more clear and don't show the elements that don't need to be shown that are irrelevant or of less importance so you don't draw um, attention to things that are not your priority. Of course, always remember that when you're creating visuals, whether these are slides or whether these are reports um, or posters, people tend to read from the top left to and going to the right, always knowing your audience. Some people don't st start reading from the left 
to the right. It depends where you're from, what is your cultural background, how you read in your native language. Um, so you need to be doing a bit of a research in your audience and know who you are going to be presenting or speaking. So you follow their cultural um, uh, trends and what the audience that you are going to be talking to uh, follows. Now, a bit of tips about colors. Now, obviously, this is the uh, color wheel. I will, the RGB, as we call it, it's the red, the green, and the blue. They are the primary colors. And then you have the secondary colors, the purple, the yellow, and the cyan. And then the uh, uh, tertiary colors, the rest of them. Now, I want to give you some guidelines on how to use the, the these colors. Uh, huge thanks to my colleague Kai who provided me with these uh, beautiful slides that he uses for his uh, teaching. But I think they are really useful to keep and download this presentation or look in, uh, you will have it or Google it and you'll find similar information. So you decide the colors that you want to use in your pie charts, in your presentations, in your bars, in the lines, etc. So the one option that you have is do a monochromatic choice, a monochromatic formula. Choose one color and do different tones of the color. So this you need to be careful because if you have a lot of variables, these tend to be a bit blurry. Um, it looks nice, but um, be careful when you use it or use it in combination with the other formulas that I will show. But if you want to have a consistency in the colors, choose a main color and use different tones for the same color. Now you can have an analogous ones, which are three consecutive colors, one beside the next. And you can use in this wheel, any three colors that are beside each other uh, should make a good, uh, um, uh, a good, not a pair since they are three, but should make a nice three elements pair. <laughs> Um, then you have the complementary, which are the opposite ones. So you see here, for example, it's the red and the green. And then if you need more, you create tones out of one of the two. So um, if you want to have a, a strong um, uh, sense of uh, complementary uh, colors, use the opposite colors in the wheels and tones of one of the two. And then you also have the, comp the split complementary, which is using the opposite, but not the exact opposite, the side opposites. And there are different ways to, so there is a logic. This is what I'm trying to tell you. Choose colors that have this logic. The triadic uh, formula, which is, you see the uh, acute example here of something that is more uh, instinct and uh, intense. And the, the triadic, which you have four colors for different colors where you create basically a square in the wheel. You choose these colors. The tip is that one of the colors should be your main one. Not all four colors should be equal to each other. Use one color out of the four uh, uh, for it being the main one and the other three being the complementary to the main, main one. And a bit of color psychology. I have also included this. Um, uh, so you can have a reference when you have this presentation, um, but it needs obviously the one and a half hours. It's not enough to cover everything. That's why I said this is visualization 101. Uh, hopefully we can organize something to go a bit deeper and have a second uh, um, uh, training on uh, presenting uh, data. Uh, but the logic is that we split colors into cool and warm. So red, orange, yellow, uh, the warm colors, they evoke emotions. Um, they tend to, when we perceive them, at least in the Western world, as uh, uh, more energetic and more passionate, whereas the blue, green, purple colors um, are the cool colors, the colder, let's say, colors, and they are more smooth and more um, close to nature. Now, obviously, there are differences. Again, you have to go through a, a bit of a research where you're going to be presenting, how the, your audience is going to perceive the different um, colors, because red, for example, does not mean danger in all the uh, 
all, all the cultures. Uh, in uh, some other uh, cultures, uh, and which are not the Western ones, for example, that we tend to use red for love or for danger. Um, it's interesting how we associate love and danger under the same color. Uh, but it could be, for example, uh, beauty or wealth and power in the Indian culture and so on. So you will have this uh, in the presentation and you can go through the different colors, but you need to be sure that what you are referring to is going to be the same code with your audience. The same thing goes for uh, color psychology, uh, following the, the moral analysis of the color psychology. And some last part, we are getting closer. It's already 3.30. Um, so we are getting closer to having a small discussion. One of the last things that I want to tell you is about storytelling. When you present data, when you present in general, whether you are uh, presenting something static or where you are speaking or presenting something through a design you made, um, a video or a live presentation or a keynote speech, you need to tell a story. So I'm going to go through um, an, a, a real life example using the 95, 95, 95 targets that we have uh, been using for advocacy reasons um, in the response for HIV um, and show you how I tried to give a storytelling for these um, um, targets in a presentation um, that uh, the Ministry of uh, the, the Republic of Cyprus uh, representatives of the ministry were also present and uh, give you um, an idea and discuss a bit, a, a bit at the end what the storytelling is about. So for those that don't know, I think everybody, most of the people who are here know, the 95, 95, 95 is a target that uh, we're trying to reach um, until 2030 um, that says that if we manage to have 95% of all the people living with HIV knowing their status, and then out of these people who know their HIV status, 95% uh, of them, which is the second 95%, have access to treatment for HIV. And out of the second 95%, out of the 95% who know they are positive, uh, HIV positive and know that they and have access to treatment, the third 95 is out of these people who have access to treatment and they are positive, they uh, are virally suppressed, which means that the virus is undetectable. 95% uh, of these people, uh, when they are undetectable, that means uh, that the aim, the target of UNAIDS is that we're going to end AIDS. That is the narrative, basically. And um, you understand that these targets are connected to each other. The first one is the 95% of all people living with HIV. So there is a 5% left out that doesn't know that they are living with HIV, although they do. And then the second one is dependent on the first one. Um, so the, the second target uh, is not a 95% of the same 100% or like the first one. And then the third 95% is dependent on the second one. So um, the uh, officials from the Republic of Cyprus, my country, decided to display the 9595 in this way. And this is a slide that I took from one of the conferences um, that I used to basically uh, advocate about the people we are leaving behind. This uh, uh, slide uh, visualization is ac actually not correct because the first bar is the 100% of all people living with HIV. The second bar for each year is the um, people who know in Cyprus that they are living with HIV. The third one is the people who, out of which, uh, the, out of the people who know that they're living with HIV, they have access to treatment. And then the last one is out of the people who know that they are positive, have access to treatment, they have a viral load that is undetectable. So note how the last bar is higher 
than the previous ones. And the, the way that this um, uh, trend is being presented by officials from the ministry is that we are doing very well in Cyprus because we are, uh, for example, let's take 2021, uh, the last bar, the last 97% uh, uh, is, is above the, um, the target that we have. So we've reached it and gone beyond it. <laughs> and then you have the second... Uh, 95, which is the third bar, the 94% in 2021, that they say, oh, we are just 1% before the target of 95%. So we are doing fantastic. We are doing great. So this was the narrative. Now, there is a prop, there is a reason why the slide that you can find in ECDC of the same target is obviously a perspective of each target being um, visually dependent on the previous one because they are dependent that each chart is dependent on the previous one so if you don't keep this analogy then you are missing the point so what i did uh, in one of these um, uh, present in one of these presentations that we had uh, to present is i corrected this slide so i presented the slide as it was showed and then i did the correction the visual correction i didn't change the percentages, I just changed the visual correction. So look, look at 2021, where you have a 92, 94, 97, and it looks like this. And then the corrected one, where you have a 92, 94, 97, but it looks like this. So now you have a perspective of how many people we are leaving behind. And not only that, we actually presented who we are leaving behind. So we are, for 2021, we are leaving behind 8% of people who know that they are living with HIV and they don't know it, which is great compared to 2014, that we were leaving behind 26% of people who were living with HIV, but they didn't know about it. And then going forward, I wanted to focus on the last year and come closer to 2021. So I maximized this. Um, I, I hope that you are seeing this clearly because I have one of the chat windows blocking it for me, but I think you can see it clearly. So I, I put this in a bigger one, a, a bigger slide with the title, Who Are We Leaving Behind? And I've actually created a black, um, uh, aspect of the bar of the people that we are leaving behind, which is 88% for the people who don't know that they're living with HIV. And then out of the people who know that they are living with HIV and have access to treatment, which is the 94%, 6% who know that they are living with HIV have no access. And then you have the, the third 95, which is the 97%, which is so above the 95%. We are doing so well in Cyprus. We are leaving 3% behind of people who are not um, virally suppressed, who, who do not have a, um, a, an undetectable viral load, which means that uh, these people are um, untransmittable. They, don't, they cannot transmit HIV to sexual practice, even without the use of condoms. So... But we should not stay here because this perspective and this target is there to tell a story, is there to reach what? By 2030, it's there to reach the fact that we want to get rid of HIV. So we really need to talk about all the people that we're leaving behind, not the perspective of each um, uh, target. So what I did is that I actually added the people that we are leaving behind uh, in regards to the 100% of people living with HIV in Cyprus, which is the exact percentage is this, and we are living 8.4% behind uh, of people who are living with HIV and they don't know. And if we uh, account everybody who doesn't have access to treatment, but they are living with HIV, whether they know it or not, that's a 14%. And then if we see the people who do not have a viral load that is undetectable, either because they, um, uh, the treatment is not working or they're not taking the treatment or they don't know that they are living with HIV, so they don't have access to treatment, so their viral load is detectable, that's 17%. So, so the story, um, you can see that the story 
completely changes out of the, we are doing fantastic in Cyprus with a 97%. Yes, but we are leaving 17% out behind out of people who don't have a viral load that is suppressed because exactly of this perspective. So, so this is a good example to show you how you can actually use this to make a point. And this visual representation is really, really useful and really, really helping us. The last part is that I took these charts and I made it black and white and I added the line of the new, um, not the new, but the, um, um, for each year, the new registrations in the national health system of people who were diagnosed with HIV. So why did I do that? This doesn't make sense in terms of statistics and um, uh, and um, analogy of doing clear mathematics. This was used only to um, make a point that we have great targets behind us in the gray background. We are reaching a 92% of the first 95, a 94% of the second 95, and 97% of the third 95. And the narrative is that it's amazing, it's fantastic. We're really close to the targets. And then when you see that the actual numbers of people living with HIV and being diagnosed in Cyprus are completely increasing in the last years, this is from 20. 14 to 2021, then it gives you the actual perspective that is not a percentage, is absolute numbers. So I did something that we would never do if we wanted our data to be correct, because if you are comparing percentages, you should display them with everything in percentages. But I put it like this to show exactly and to say in the presentation that, yes, we are doing well in terms of targets, but the people who are actually Diag being diagnosed are the number is increasing. And then the next slide is basically that line into um, the real um, uh, the real absolute numbers of the new percentages. So I will stay up to here. I mean, I have some uh, more um, uh, slides where um, I was showing that, you know, the different numbers in Cyprus, for example, it's very clear that uh, the, um, the roots of transmission in terms of vertical transmission, uh, injecting drug use, transfusion, so communal uh, transmission or unknown, is the, the base really, really small numbers all these years from 2010 to 2022, and that uh, the major um, uh, transmission route in Cyprus is sexual transmission, whether it's between men who have sex with men or hetero, as they call it. I use the slide of the um, uh, ECDC and the ministry, so they see something that is um, um, recognizable to them. So basically, I uh, the, the, the storytelling was that, yes, so basically we have more people uh, being diagnosed every year with HIV um, that are mainly um, uh, getting HIV because of sexual practices, because of sex. And this shows that sex is the main route of transmission in Cyprus. And I continue with this slide saying that, you know, the main transmission is sex, but in Cyprus, a country of less than a million population, uh, sex is a taboo. We don't discuss about it. We have an issue with having uh, sex in education in schools but it is the leading uh, route of transmission. And the last two slides, and I closed the presentation like that, I said, do you believe that we can succeed in reaching the UNAIDS targets in, by 2030? This was a rhetorical question. I didn't expect the audience to answer, but it was a question. And then I went a step further and said, what do you think we should do to reach these targets? So I didn't finish up by saying, you know, everything that is wrong with the country or the system or, you know, everything that should be done. But I just posed some questions whether they think that we are doing well, really, because these data uh, showing it with a different visualization tells a different narrative from displaying a different visual of the same data. And then uh, 
asking them what we think that we should be doing. So why am I telling you this? Because the storytelling is really important and you need to use the tools that you need to have in order to tell the story, use the, uh, the storytelling. And what is the storytelling? Is to set the goal. What is the goal? You need to know your goal beforehand, before you start analyzing the data, putting them into charts or pie charts or bar charts or graphs, before preparing your data. It's really important to know your goal. Then set the path that how are you going to end up to your goal? You have to start from A and go to B and go to C and to D in order to reach E. So you have to have a plan, basically. And then when you have your goal clear and you have your path there of how you're going to present this, you need to prepare the data to say that. We will, of course, talk a bit about the ethics of the thing because you don't need to choose only the data that serve your goals, obviously. You need to be ethical as well. But I will close this section of the storytelling saying that it's really the importance of clean, accurate data is huge. The importance of annotations and labels and legends to guide viewers through the visuals, explain people what they see, explain the access, explain the numbers, explain and anything that is relevant to the goal that you have in a chart, you need to explain it. And there are different ways to do it, but keep it simple, keep it clean. Um, don't overcrowd it with too much text. The importance of deciding the goal and designing the path to reach it, and the importance of telling a story, and every story has a beginning, a path, a middle, and an ending. So you need to decide how you're going to end this story. In my case, for example, I decided to end this story with two rhetorical questions. You can end with different ways, with a video, with a, um, an open discussion, with a, a, a quotation, with a, uh, anything that you think serves your goal. Now, um, I will go through the, the things that you must do. You must prepare. You need to prepare before you stand in front of people and present anything. And you need to know your shit. You need to know what you're talking about. Don't present things you don't know or you don't understand. The second thing is that you need to use titles and annotations and labels so people understand what you are showing. So your graphs should not have information like my generic ones in the beginning that don't explain what the access is. Is it time? Is it money? Is it uh, people? Is it years? Is it months? What is it? And then use sources and if possible, use links. This is really important because it, it gives a validity to the data that you are presenting. Where did you get the data? Um, so uh, I've not only used sources here, but I've even nicked, stolen a video that is online, which is not mine, obviously, for the purposes of this education. So just so you know that if you are using anything that is publicly available for educational purposes, there is no copyright for educational purposes. There is, however, copyright if you are exploiting it and you're making money out of it. But if you're using it for educational purposes or presenting something and you're not being um, uh, getting money or, or having any kind of uh, um, uh, conflict of interest with uh, this data, the intellectual property is, is okay to use for educational purposes. Use colors wisely because they really help. Follow the charts that I've given you as an example and combine these colors because beauty will always be appreciated when you present something that looks nice. Use maps where possible. Use a variety of charts or graphs or visuals. Don't have only one-sided um, uh, visuals. Try to use a combination in um, so you can keep it interesting. And use humor where possible. Now, what you should not do, you should not, uh, by all means, use charts or graphs that do not relate to the data. So you need to be careful. And that's why I showed you a number of different examples. You know, if you're trying to make a point that this checkpoint is doing 
testing and the access to migrant populations is growing, the percentages, for example, might show that better in a better way than the um, uh, the absolute numbers. I'm just giving an example. So you need to make sure that what you are visually displaying serves the data that uh, are, are creating that visual. Make sure that you don't use wrong representation of the data. Make sure um, that you don't put wrong num numbers. You know, you have a pie chart where if somebody adds up the numbers, they don't add up to 100% because it should be 100%. It should not be 101, you know. Uh, so you, you need to um, make a good representation. Don't misrepresent the data. Don't overcomplicate visuals. Don't try to put everything in it. Better to put things out and have something clean and clear rather than put everything in and making it a salad that has not only sweet elements, but also sour and some lemon and some, uh, uh, I don't know, fruits and add some vinegar. And then you can't eat it if you put everything uh, all together unless you can. <laughs> so um, misleading accesses. So when you have an, uh, an, a Y and an uh, X uh, axis, try to have a correct uh, explanation. Don't use misleading accesses. Display um, non-relevant information. This is a definitely must not. Don't display information that is not relevant. It's not needed. Uh, what I call the manual effect. You don't need to have slides that are full of words, full of um, um, paragraphs, uh, which make your slide feel like a book and a manual instead of a presentation. If you have on a slide all the things that you are actually reading and you are reading it of the slide, then you don't have to because you know your audience can actually read themselves. So it's better to give a visual information that supports what you're saying instead of giving them um, a book on your slide. Um, some useful tools, and this is the last part. Um, the useful tools are obviously, you know, Microsoft Excel or Apple Numbers or Google Spreadsheets. Um, uh, Google Spreadsheets are free. Um, Microsoft PowerPoint, Apple Keynote, and Google Slides. Google Slides are free. Um, you use whatever it's you more easy for you, more accessible to you, <coughs> and gives you better results in terms of what you want to do. Um, if you don't know, ask Google. Do double check, but ask Google or ask uh, AI, uh, ChatGPT or Gemini. So. You, need, uh, you don't need to know everything. You can ask and get answers, but double check them. Uh, that doesn't mean that everything that Google says or ChatGPT says is everything is, everything is accurate. Check it and see if it is actually uh, um, accurate. Uh, a small tip when I had to do the adjustments on the 95, 95, 95 accesses from the charts of the ministry, I had to play a bit with ChatGPT and give a number of different prompts and ask ChatGPT to calculate for me the correct percentages of the pie chart from the whole 100 instead from the 95%. So I could have the correct representation. And I am not amazing with maths, so I did use ChatGPT to do that and then double check that it was okay doing the other way around, you know, going from the other side and checking if the percentages that I got from uh, ChatGPT made sense. And always proofread. And saying that, I hope that I didn't have any uh, wrong words or wrong numbers in my presentation because that would make me feel stupid. And um, I don't think that we have much time to go through um, an example of how we could use some of these elements, but there are a lot of tools online. Some of them are free. Um, Coursera, for example, has a lot of free uh, courses. Some of them are free online on YouTube or other platforms that you can get information. And some of them are really cheap if you want to go through and uh, learn how 
uh, you would be using uh, these tools. I've done a couple of uh, trainings like that in order to learn better on how to use AI uh, programs. And the ethic part is the last part that um, uh, I would like to open to the floor if we have um, time. 